Let's pray. <clears throat> Father, thank you for your graciousness toward us. And as we discuss giving, and I don't know if this will be the last sermon, I don't feel like it's something we just preach on much here, so I do want to take full advantage of it when given the opportunity. One of my greatest desires for any sermons on, on giving or that it wouldn't be something that we would see ourselves obligated to do or bound to do because of a law or a command in Scripture, but really a, an outpouring of worship for you, that giving isn't something we have to do, but it's something that we get to do because of all that's been done for us. I think uh, it's evident that you desire us to give cheerfully and joyfully, which can be a challenge. And so I pray you'd use this sermon fully in our lives to be cheerful givers. I pray that this, really, Lord, I can preach a sermon, I can read scripture, but it's something that your Holy Spirit has to do in our hearts to conform us into the image of your Son and to give us hearts that desire to worship you through giving. And so I do pray for that, Lord. I pray that we'd recognize it's not about some amount, but it's about worship and that people wouldn't leave here feeling um, convicted about a certain amount or how much they have to give, but would really be convicted that they get to give out of worship because of all that's been given to us, Lord. And so use this time to its fullest, especially since I don't think we preach on giving that much. I don't know when it'll be visited again. And so I do thank you for this grace that you have given us, being able to worship you this way and then come along the side the ministry that's happening, whether with our missionaries or any other ministry in the church. And that when we give to the church, it's a, a way for us to be, feel like in some uh, small part we're participating in that, Lord, which is wonderful. And so I do thank you for this time. I thank you for your word. Pray that it would be used powerfully in each person's life, including my own. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 So the title of this morning's sermon is God Loves a Cheerful Giver and Six Ways to Become One. So if you're new to joining us, there's been a few sermons on giving. And we might be back in Luke next Sunday. I always kind of make that decision during the week. So I used to coach junior high wrestling in California in a kind of lower income area. And, after, and they hadn't really had wrestling for a few years. And so when I started coaching, I think there was a lot of excitement about it from the, re from the young people who, who were excited to be able to wrestle. And so after one season, some of my wrestlers decided that they were going to buy me a gift. And because it was a bunch of junior hires, they kind of had to pool their money to do this. And they all really excitedly rode their bikes to this shop and ordered this plaque and then picked up this plaque the day of the banquet. And then they were riding from the, the shop where they had gotten this plaque for me to the banquet, and one of them crashed on his bike and dropped the plaque, and, and I don't know if he rode over it or something happened for the plaque itself to get super scuffed up on the road. And so when they gave me the plaque, that's one of the first things I noticed about it, that it was kind of messed up, and my thought was, well, apparently this plaque must have been given to someone else or had, you know, with the same name as me because it looks like it's got a lot of wear and tear on it. Uh, they didn't even tell me what happened because they were all so excited to give this to me that they had all worked together for this gift. And then when they remembered to tell me why it was all scuffed up, that one of them had gotten in an accident or dropped it or something, they were very apologetic about that. But guess why I didn't feel they needed to apologize for this gift? Part it was just a sign of their affection for me, and they had given it to me so joyfully or so cheerfully, to use biblical language, their, their excitement associated with being able to give me something just meant so much to me that regardless of what the gift looked like or the condition that it was in, I found it to be very significant. And I think that's the case for all gifts, that regardless of what a gift is, it's generally meaningful because of the way that it's given. The significance behind the gift uh, relates to the way that the gift is given to us. Now, the opposite is also true. A gift can be given to us cheerfully or joyfully, and that makes the gift meaningful. A gift could also be given to us very reluctantly. Picture people who give through clenched teeth, or people, figuratively speaking, where you almost have to pry the gift out of their hands. So imagine they say something like, you know, I hope this gift makes you happy but I bet you'd never give me something like this. Or, you better appreciate this because you would not believe how difficult it was for me to get it. Or, I didn't want to give this to you, but I knew it was your birthday and I had to get you something, so I hope you enjoy it, right? You know, how, how me, no matter what the gift is, it is not going to be meaningful when it's given to you with a bad attitude. I didn't put this in my notes, but Katie and I were just reflecting yesterday on this one time someone had come to the house 
to give her, I guess, lend, lend Katie a book. And when the person was about to hand it to her, she kind of pauses and at the last moment, like, holds on to it and, and had all these qualifications, how she better get the book back in the exact same condition, another, nothing better happen to it. And so Katie just said what? She said, hey, it's not, no big deal. Why don't you just, you know, go ahead and keep this book? And so the way something is given to us is the iceberg, if we continue that analogy. I had shared with you in a previous sermon about sacrifice, the sacrifice behind giving or sacrificial giving, that if we use that iceberg analogy, the gift is only the iceberg above the surface. Everything that goes into the gift, all of the sacrifice, that was that sermon, or the cheerfulness or attitude behind giving the gift is everything below the surface. Nobody wants to get a gift from stingy people, and the Bible even discourages us from accepting them. Proverbs 23, 6. Do not eat the bread of a man who is stingy. Do not desire his delicacies, for he is like one who is inwardly calculating, eat and drink, he says to you, but his heart is not with you. So in other words, you're enjoying something from him, but it's clearly something that he doesn't want you to have. You're enjoying his stuff but he doesn't want you to have his stuff. And so the Bible says, don't take anything from stingy people who don't have a heart behind what you're receiving from them. Now, if you're a parent, I hope this doesn't come as a a shock to any children, and you think about a child giving you a gift, unless, if we're honest, unless we have a child who's incredibly talented, most of the gifts that our children give us are not gifts we would buy in stores, right? If we saw them on a shelf, we wouldn't say, that looks so valuable that I want to spend my money on it. So my point is, when our kids give us gifts, why are those gifts meaningful? Not because of the value of the gift, but, yeah, but because of what's behind that gift. The sacrifice in them making it or the cheerfulness with which they give it to us. It's the attitude or the heart behind the gift that's a sign of their affection, a sign of their love for us that makes that gift meaningful. 2 Corinthians 9, 7 says, Each one, and you can go ahead and turn there, that's where we'll find ourselves this morning as we continue a bit in these two chapters. 2 Corinthians 9, 7 says, Each one must give as he has decided in his heart, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. And so we see that just as like that, when I was a coach, that gift would not have meant much to me if my wrestlers had given it to me and then qualified it by how, how uh, hard it was for them to get and had really bad attitudes when they gave it to me. Or imagine if our children give us gifts with bad attitudes, just like we don't want that, a gift given to us in that sort of way. Our Heavenly Father also does not want gifts given to him with a bad attitude. Instead, he loves a cheerful giver, it says. Now, we looked at this verse, most of it, in a previous sermon, but I didn't cover the conclusion, in particular, God loving a cheerful giver. Now, the Greek word translated reluctantly, it's lipe, lipe, and it means with grief, with sorrow, or with sadness. And so that means that God doesn't want gifts given to him with grief or with sorrow or with sadness. Or as one person said, God wants glad givers, not sad or mad givers. Robert Rodemeyer said, there are three kinds of giving, grudge giving, duty giving, and thanksgiving. Grudge giving says, I have to. Duty giving says, I ought to. And Thanksgiving says, I want to. And so we can tell the kind of giving that God wants from us, Thanksgiving. The Greek, and really, this is why it's so important to recognize that we're not commanded under the New Testament or New Covenant to give a tithe, something that I've taught before, because if we felt bound or commanded to give a tithe, then there wouldn't be any way for us to give out of Thanksgiving. Instead, it would have to be duty or even grudge giving. The Greek word translated as cheerful, when it says that God loves a cheerful giver, it's the word hilaros, hilaros, which is related to our word what? Hilarious. This is the only place that occurs in Scripture. And so God wants giving from hearts that find it enjoyable, or find, I wouldn't say necessarily entertaining, 
but the word does mean enjoyable or entertaining. So God wants people to give in a way that we find pleasure in it. Now here's what you might be saying if you remember the previous sermon about giving sacrificially. You're kind of recognizing this tension. If you could talk to me, you'd say, well, Pastor Scott, I'm trying to reconcile these two sermons. In a previous sermon, you talked about giving sacrificially, and now you're talking about giving cheerfully, and you pretty much have to choose one or the other, right? Because I can give sacrificially or I can give cheerfully, but if I do one, I'm not going to do the other because they're, they're mutually exclusive. There's tension there. The more sacrificially I give, then the less cheerfully I give. The more cheerfully I give, then the less sacrifice there is behind it. So it's got to be one or the other. But if you remember what we learned about the Macedonians, they're a great example. If you look in 2 Corinthians 8, I'll go through this quickly because we studied it in the previous sermon. 2 Corinthians 8, 1, Paul said, We want you to know, brothers about the grace of God that has been given among the churches of Macedonia. So Paul is telling the Corinthians about the way the Macedonians gave because of the great example the Macedonians set for the Corinthians. And so he says in verse 2, in a severe test of affliction, their abundance, or the Macedonians' abundance of joy and their extreme poverty have overflowed in a wealth of generosity on their part. So in verse 2, we see that they gave with an abundance of joy, which is to say that they gave what? They gave cheerfully. It also says they gave in extreme poverty. Or they were extremely poor, which is to say that they also gave sacrificially. It says, despite their poverty, overflowed a wealth of generosity on their part. So even though they were destitute, they still gave generously or still gave sacrificially while also giving with joy or cheerfully. So it's possible to do both. Now, if you find it challenging to give, which I suspect most of us do, uh, at least to some point, then I hope that these six encouragements will give you good reason to strive to be cheerful givers. And this brings us to lesson one. Give cheerfully because lesson one, God loves a cheerful giver. Give cheerfully because God loves a cheerful giver. This should be enough reason to give. If no other one, then God loves cheerful givers. So as Christians, we want to be familiar with what God loves, and there are quite a few examples in Scripture. Here's 10 of them. Deuteronomy 7.9 says that God loves those who keep his commandments. Psalm 11.7 says God loves righteous deeds. Psalm 17.7 says God loves those who seek refuge from their adversities at his right hand. Psalm 33, 5 says God loves righteousness and justice. Proverbs 8, 17 says God loves those who love him. Proverbs 15, 9 says God loves those who pursue righteousness. John 3, 16 says God loves what? The world. John 16, 27, God the Father loves those who love his Son. Romans 5, 8 says that God loved us while we were still what? Sinners. Hebrews 12, 6, which is a quote of Proverbs 3.12, says that God loves those he disciplines. It's evidence that he's our father and we are his children. Now, finally, according to 2 Corinthians 9.7, it got, says that God loves a cheerful giver. But I want you to notice what it doesn't say. It doesn't say that God loves cheerful giving, although we suspect that's the case. He's actually describing a certain person. It says that God loves a cheerful giver. He loves people who give cheerfully. The Amplified Bible said God loves a cheerful giver and delights in the one whose heart is in or behind the gift. So God loves everyone, but he has a unique love for cheerful givers. And so because we love the Lord and we want to be people that he loves, then for that reason alone, we should want to give cheerfully. The next reason Give cheerfully because lesson two, it sends wealth ahead. It sends wealth ahead. So consider this story. There's a rich man who dies and goes to heaven. And Abraham greets him and says, Welcome to heaven. Let me show you where you'll be staying. And as Abraham and the rich man walk, the rich man sees beautiful mansions stretching out in every direction. They're constructed of gold, silver, precious gems, 
And as they passed one mansion, the rich man said, wow, who gets to stay here? And Abraham replied, that's for your groundskeeper. He was a godly man who loved Jesus and served him all his life. This is his reward. They continue past other mansions until they reach an extremely large one. And the rich man says to Abraham, is this one mine? And Abraham says, no, this one belongs to your maid. On the little bit of money that you paid her, she raised six children and gave to her church. They continued to walk until they came to a different section of homes that were not as nice. As they walked up a small hill, they stopped in front of a shack that was made out of tar paper and used sheet metal. The front door was cut out of an old refrigerator box. It was held together with baling wire, twine, and duct tape. After pausing momentarily, the rich man said, who lives here? And Abraham responded, why, this is your house. And the rich man couldn't believe it. He said, there must be some mistake. And Abraham said, no, there's no mistake. We did the best we could with what you gave us. <laughs> so the point this story makes is that it is incredibly tragic how many people will prepare well for the next few years or decades of this earthly life while neglecting that eternal life that follows. So we have two choices with our wealth. And the first choice is to send it ahead. Whatever we give to God's kingdom, and that doesn't mean, this isn't my attempt to, to just get you to, to give more to the church. I hope that's evident. We don't even pass the, the plate here. This refers to end, any kingdom-minded giving, to, to missionaries or anything that would further the gospel. But the first choice is to give for the furthering of God's kingdom, and whatever we give away on this side of heaven is going to be kept for eternity. And so the best givers in this life have much waiting for them in the next life. And again, this has more to do with the sacrifice or heart behind the giving than it does with the um, with the amount and jesus we have a an account in scripture that perfectly captures this that's the major point behind the widow's might that she gave a lot even though she gave little she gave a tiny amount but jesus pointed out how great the amount was because of the sacrifice that went behind it and how much more she actually gave than all the wealthy people who put in much because there wasn't much sacrifice. As George Mueller says, God judges us by what we keep, not by what we give. And so who knows how much that widow stored up for her, who knows what her mansion will look like in heaven someday, right? So the best givers in this life will have much waiting for them in the next life. Now the second choice with our wealth is to keep it for ourselves. And we have a parable about, a parable about an individual doing this, and that's the rich fool, which has always been a kind of interesting title to me because the rich fool looked from an earthly perspective very what? From an earthly perspective, denying all spiritual application, the rich fool looked very what? Wise. I mean, he was an incredibly shrewd, talented businessman that accumulated great wealth, seemed to have done very well for himself in the ancient world where there weren't nearly as many wealthy people as there are today. So he looks wise, but Jesus calls him a rich fool because he didn't give any thought to eternity. Luke 12, 18, Jesus said that the rich fool said, I'll do this, I'll tear down my barns, I'll build larger ones. There I'll store all my grain and my goods. And I'll say to my soul, soul, you have ample goods laid up for many years. Relax, eat, drink, be merry. Now, if we keep our wealth for ourselves, then like this man, we will be prepared for the next few years or decades of this life, but we'll be unprepared for the next. When we choose to enjoy our wealth now, we don't get to enjoy it in heaven, which could leave us wealthy in this life, destitute in the next life. So listen to what God says to him. Luke 12, 12 20, Fool, this night your soul is required of you, and the things you have prepared, whose will they be? So Christ's point is that when this man dies, where will all of this wealth be left? He says, who is it going to belong to? And we don't really know who it will belong to. We just know who it won't belong to. That's kind of what's behind the question. Because when Jesus says, whose will all this be? The answer is, not his. So Jesus is trying to make the point that he's going to leave all of it behind. Whatever we accumulate in this life is going to be left to others. 
And this brings us to the next reason to give cheerfully. Lesson three, because we can't take wealth with us. Matthew 6, 19, Jesus said, Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. So Jesus described what happens to our earthly possessions. He used an ancient description of them breaking down by saying there's going to be moth, there's going to be rust, thieves could break in and steal it, things decay, they get stolen. And so his, his point is that we don't really keep anything, earthly possessions or earthly wealth, for any great length of time. And keeping this in mind or remembering that reality should make giving cheerfully much easier. Because as soon as we start thinking about our possessions being destroyed by moth, rust, or thieves breaking in and stealing it, then suddenly I think all of our wealth and possessions lose value. And it's much easier to give something away that lacks value. And so I mean this seriously. As soon as we have an eternal perspective and our earthly possessions lose significant value, it becomes that much easier to part with them, right? I mean, who are the only people that are really hold tightly the earthly wealth or possessions that they have? That would be people with the shortest view, very short-sighted, only seeing this life without seeing the next life. And even... If it doesn't happen with our wealth and our lifetimes that moth or rust destroy it or thieves break in and steal it, we still lose it when we die because we can't take it with us. The spirit is immaterial, it's non-physical. The body is material or physical. When, the, when our spirits, our bodies, our spirits bring nothing material or physical with them. And so we come into the world with nothing, we leave with nothing. As Job said, 121, naked I came from my mother's womb, naked shall I return. Psalm 49.10, Korah said, Men leave their wealth to others. When they die, they shall carry away nothing. Ecclesiastes 5.15, Solomon said, As he came from his mother's womb, naked shall he return to go as he came, and he shall take nothing from his labor, which he may carry away in his hand. 1 Timothy 6.7, Paul told Timothy, We brought nothing into the world, and it's certain we can carry nothing out of it. So as I've told you many times before, God repeats himself when he wants to make sure we don't miss something, and God repeatedly reminds us that we take nothing with us. He is not doing this to discourage us, or he isn't reminding us, reminding us of this reality to make us depressed. Instead, he constantly reminds us of this truth so that we live in light of it, so that we keep it in mind. Randy Alcorn said, when Jesus warns us not to store up treasures on earth, it is not just because wealth might be lost. It is because wealth will always be lost. We leave it all behind when we die. Realizing its value, wealth's value, is temporary should radically affect our investment strategy. So knowing we leave everything behind should make it much easier to send wealth ahead or be generous, or give cheerfully. Jim Elliott, the well-known Christian missionary, killed along with the other five men while trying to evangelize the Harani people of Ecuador, he famously said, he is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. Let me say that one more time. Jim Elliott's quote, he is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. Now this quote applies perfectly to earthly wealth. We should give cheerfully because we can't take wealth with us, but what we can do is we can give it or send it ahead for the next life. The next reason to be a cheerful giver, lesson four, we only enjoy wealth for a short time. Lesson four, we only enjoy wealth for a short time. So imagine this situation. Imagine there's a house that you've wanted for as long as you can remember. And then imagine that one day the owner hands you the keys to the house and says you can have it. And you're excited, but then he adds, the only catch is this house is going to burn down in the near future. So now how excited are you about that house? Well, you're not excited about it because you know you're only going to enjoy it for a short period of time. 
Well, what's the irony of that story or illustration? The irony is that what applies to that house applies to every possession in our lives when viewed in light of eternity. Because even if something is enjoyed for years or decades, in light of eternity, it's only enjoyed for a very short period of time. 2 Peter 3.10, I mean, regarding the house burning down, the reason that I chose that, you say, well, that sounds pretty dramatic. Well, the reason I chose that is that's what we're told is going to happen with our stuff. 2 Peter 3.10, the day of the Lord will come like a thief, and then the heavens will pass away with a roar, and the heavenly bodies will be burned up. So if we live in light of that reality that all of our possessions are going to be destroyed, then they pretty much become about as meaningless, meaningful or meaningless, depending on how you look at it, as that house that we're only going to enjoy for a short period of time. Instead, every single resource or possession we have should really be viewed as a stewardship that's given to us for us to use with God's kingdom in mind. So it isn't to say that God wouldn't ever want us to have anything nice. It's just to say that if God has given us something nice, then our accountability is higher and God would expect us to be using that possession in a way that brings him glory and furthers his kingdom. The Christian life, it must be viewed by keeping its shortness in view. I've told you before that when Jonathan Edwards was only 19, he wrote 70 resolutions that he committed to practicing for God's glory. And number nine was this, to think much on all occasions of my dying. Now, if you had to provide a list of the things you don't want to think about or you try not to think about, more than likely, toward the top of that list will probably be death. It doesn't come up in conversations because we don't like to talk about it. We don't like to think about it. It seems discouraging to us. But the reality is, there's probably not many better things for us to think about than the reality that this life is going to come to an end. And Jonathan Edwards had made a resolution that he was going to think about the day of his death as often as possible, probably every single day. It might sound a little morbid, but can you imagine the effect that it had on him to think constantly of his dying so that he could live in light of that reality? Jonathan Edwards is not the only one who thinks we should focus on the shortness of this life. God wants us to do the same thing, and we know that because this is something else he repeats in Scripture. James 4.14, what is your life? It is even a vapor that appears for a little while and then vanishes away. Job 7.7, 7, he said, my life is a breath. Psalm 102, verse 3, my days are consumed like smoke. Psalm 144.4, man is like a breath, his days are like a passing shadow. So another way that we can give cheerfully is by keeping in mind the temporary nature of this life, because we recognize that all of the wealth or possessions we have are only going to be enjoyed for a very short period. Adam Clark said, it requires but little of this world's goods to satisfy a man who feels himself to be a citizen of another country and knows that this is not his home. Let me say that one more time. It's not really the language that, that we use commonly. He said, it requires but little of this world's goods to satisfy a man, or in other words, a man with God's kingdom in mind can be satisfied with very little because he recognizes he's the citizen of another country and this is not his home. Now, the shortness of this life or the shortness of what we get to enjoy, I think is illustrated really well by an account that occurred with Daniel. So here's the background. Belshazzar was the king of Babylon, and Babylon was the superpower of the day. Daniel had been brought into Babylon under Nebuchadnezzar, who had become a godly man through what God had afflicted him with, but Belshazzar seemed to remain an ungodly man. And so he has this huge party where he invites 1,000 lords. They drink from the vessels that the Babylonians took from the temple when they conquered the Jews. And I can only imagine he's bordering on blasphemy when he decides that he's going to use the temple vessels to get to throw this party, to get drunk, and get all these other lords drunk. So while they're drinking and they're praising their false gods, what famously happened? 
Yeah, this hand appears on the wall and starts writing, terrifies Belshazzar, I'm assuming terrified others, but it describes Belshazzar's knees knocking together, practically coming out of joint, probably recognizing that being blasphemous wasn't a good idea. So he's told that there's someone in the kingdom, Daniel, who could read this and interpret it for Belshazzar. So Belshazzar says to Daniel, if you can make known to me this interpretation, you'll be clothed with purple. You'll have a chain of gold around your neck. You're going to be the third ruler in the kingdom, the kingdom that's the superpower of the day. And Daniel answered Belshazzar, and he said, let your gifts be for yourself. Give your rewards to another, but I will still make known the interpretation. So Daniel interprets it for the king, and then Belshazzar, Daniel 5.29, gives the command they clothed Daniel with purple, as Belshazzar said would happen. They put a chain of gold around his neck. They make a proclamation concerning him that he should be the third ruler in the kingdom. And then what happened that night for the Babylonian kingdom, which is exactly what was written on the wall? The Medes and Persians allied together, came in, defeated Babylon, overthrew the nation, and now Daniel doesn't, is no longer a Babylonian, now he's a Persian, Right? That very night, Belshazzar, king of the Babylonians, was slain, and Darius the Mede received the kingdom. Now, the reason I often think about this is that Daniel was offered the most common worldly desires, riches, fame, position, and he declined it because he knew that it was all temporary. Now, my suspicion, because Daniel was such a godly man, he probably would have declined all this even if it wasn't temporary. So even though he didn't want it, Belshazzar gives the rewards anyway, and Daniel only possesses them for a few hours. Now, it's tempting to say, well, Daniel, no pun intended, he read the writing on the wall. So he knew that the kingdom was only going to endure for a few more hours, or in other words, he knew that he was only going to enjoy those rewards for a few more hours. So maybe we feel like we don't relate to Daniel very well because we say, well, what I enjoy, I can enjoy it for years, or I can enjoy it for decades. But as soon as we view whatever we enjoy in light of reality, then suddenly it becomes just a few hours or just a few moments. I mean, our, light, our lives are that sliver of light, you know, with eternity in front of it. Keeping that in mind should make giving cheerfully much easier for us. And then give cheerfully because lesson five, God sees what's in our hearts versus what's in our hands. God sees what's in our hearts versus what's in our hands. I'm trying to have a lot of discussion of our hearts because it's evident to me that when the New Testament discusses giving, the heart behind the giving is more significant than the amount, which is also why you won't hear me talk about an amount much. The New Testament doesn't talk about an amount. So imagine there's a man who has his wallet divided into two sections. And he heads to church, and in one section, he puts the amount of money that he plans to give to the church. And then in the other section, he puts the rest of his cash, which is a considerably larger amount. So in one section he's got, of his wallet, he's got the small amount that he's going to give to the church. And then in the other section, he's got the much larger amount that he's going to keep for himself. And then this is the church where they pass the plate. So the plate comes around and he quickly reaches into his wallet and he takes out the money from the wrong section. And so he ends up giving the very large amount of cash into the plate. After service, he realizes what happened. So he goes up to the pastor and he comforts himself by telling the pastor, it really doesn't matter that I gave the larger amount because I gave it to the Lord and the Lord recognizes the amount that I gave. And then the pastor says to him, well, how much did you intend to give? And the man says, well, I intended to give that smaller amount, but I accidentally gave the larger amount. And then the pastor replied, then that smaller amount is what God recognizes because that's what you decided to give in your heart. And so the point of that is God isn't looking at what's in our hand. Here he's not looking at what we write on the check. He's looking at what's in our hearts when we give. He's looking at the way we give. He's looking at the heart of worship behind what we give. One of the best ways to encourage cheerful giving is by remembering that God is looking at our hearts rather than the amount. 
Giving is a heart issue because as 1 Samuel 16, 7 says, the Lord looks at the heart. Now, to emphasize, I don't know if there's any greater emphasis on the heart than the Sermon on the Mount. In the Sermon on the Mount, it kind of looks like this challenging sermon, it, you know, at least for me, because I'm kind of, try to be kind of logical, you know, I pour over my sermons, I want there to be related points, and I want people to listen and kind of know where I'm going, and be able to follow and understand what I'm saying, so I'm, I'm convinced God's Word works better when it's understood, and so I, you know, want to be logical, and so you kind of look at the Sermon on the Mount, and you're like, it's just almost looks kind of, you know, jumbled at first. There's all these different points, you know, there's no, there's no theme. It's just Jesus is everywhere. He's talking about this, and he's talking about this, and he's talking about this. But there is actually a theme, and what is the theme of the Sermon on the Mount? It's the heart. That's what he's preaching about. And all of these interrelated things associated with the heart. Now, in Matthew 5, 21 to 41, you don't have to turn there, but Jesus condemned things that we would expect him to condemn. He condemns murder, he condemns adultery, he condemns lying, and he condemns them the way that we would expect. He says that they're bad when they're done physically, but they're just as bad when they're done in our heart. But what's interesting is in the next chapter when Jesus talks about the heart, he condemns new things, but not things we would expect. Because in Matthew 5, when he condemns murder, adultery, lying, retaliation, or unforgiveness, or vengeance, we look and say, well, I get why Jesus would condemn those, because those are evil things. But then in Matthew 6, what does Jesus condemn? It's interesting. He actually condemns prayer. He condemns giving. Listen to this. Matthew 6, 1 and 2, beware of practicing your righteousness before other people in order to be seen by them, for then you will have no reward from your Father who is in heaven. Thus, when you give to the needy, sound no trumpet before you, as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, that they may be praised by others. Truly, I say to you, they have received their reward. So we've got Jesus condemning serving when it's done the wrong way, when it's done because we want to be seen by others and the offense is so serious that regardless of the amount given it results in a loss of reward and if we miss that the first time jesus repeats it a second time it seems he wants to help us avoid losing our reward and he even gave instructions about giving with the right heart in the next verse matthew 6 3 and 4 he says when you give to the needy do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing so that your giving may be in secret and your father who sees in secret will reward you now not trying to be funny, but of course, hands don't have um, minds of their own. You know, we can't hide from one hand what the other hand is doing. And so Jesus' point is we should give in a way that nobody knows what we are doing except the Lord, where we should give secretly. But the main point is that when we give with the wrong heart, it's a form of giving that Jesus condemns, or even when we pray, or even when we serve with the wrong heart, to be seen or to be heard by others to impress others. It's being done in a way that doesn't impress our Heavenly Father. So that's how important the heart is behind the things we do, including even giving. And then give cheerfully because lesson six of all we've been given. Lesson six, give cheerfully because of all we've been given. So here's an important principle in Scripture. We should do for others what God has done for us. God expects us to do for others what he has done for us. And I'll give you some examples. Jesus said in John 13, 34, as I have loved you, you also love one another. So we're to love others because God loved us. Right? The world says this, be good. It's why I'm not always, not much of a fan of Santa Claus or a lot of Christmas songs. But the world says, be good for what? For goodness sake. That's about as unbiblical as you can get. <laughs> the Bible says, be good because God's been good to you. You do it uh, not to be saved, but you do it as an outpouring of your salvation. So we love others, not for love's sake, but we love others because God loved us. And the parable of the unforgiving spirit, or excuse me, the unforgiving servant, the master rebuked the unforgiving servant, and he said, Matthew 18, 32, you wicked servant, I forgave you all that debt because you begged me. 
Should you not also have had compassion on your fellow servant, just as I had pity on you? So the wicked servant was condemned because, not just because he wouldn't forgive someone else, but because he had been forgiven for so much and wouldn't forgive someone else. And so we should forgive others, not for forgiveness' sake, but because God has forgiven us. Ephesians 4.32, forgive one another, even as God in Christ forgave you. Now, I'm saying all that to build up to this. Regarding giving, we give because God has given us so much. Ephesians 5.1, it commands us to be imitators of God. And that's one of the ways that we should imitate God. He's a giver, so we should be givers. Listen to this proverb, 21.26. The righteous gives and does not spare. The righteous gives and does not spare. Why is giving righteous? Why is giving a righteous thing to do? Because God gives. God's nature defines morality. Things are moral based on God's nature or character. And because God gives, giving is a righteous thing to do what god does or what god does defines righteousness or morality for us and so the proverb says that the righteous give because that's what righteous people do because god is righteous he defines righteousness and he's a giver now let me conclude with this i once read about a stingy man who said the preacher told us to give until it hurts so i don't give it all just because the thought of giving hurts <laughs> Now, if we feel like this man and giving hurts, even after these six reasons to give cheerfully, we know that giving will still be a painful thing for us. I want to give us three recommendations. First, confess that struggle to the Lord. I think there's this tendency to want to hide our struggles from God like we're going to keep them a secret from him as though like he doesn't already know we have this struggle right so i don't i don't want to tell god i'm struggling with this because then he'll know he already knows right he knows us better than we know ourselves he knows all men he knows what's in our hearts so there's no reason not to share with the lord a struggle we have whether it's giving or something else so if we struggle giving cheerfully or giving well then that's something that we should confess and pray that God helps us grow in that area. We can ask him to replace our joylessness with joyfulness, our cheerlessness with cheerfulness. We can even acknowledge, Lord, I don't have the best heart when I give. Can you take away my wrong heart associated with giving and give me a right heart associated with giving? Second, we should look to Scripture for the weaknesses or struggles we have. We should look to Scripture for the answers to life's questions and problems. We should look to Scripture for the weaknesses and struggles that we have. And so when we have a struggle associated with something, whether giving or something else besides praying about it, we should also look to Scripture. We can read the verses that apply. We can meditate on them. We can even memorize them. Maybe we can write those verses on note cards. We can put them in places that we'll see them regularly, whether a refrigerator, mirror, car dashboard. Even a great place would be if you have trouble giving cheerfully, memorize 2 Corinthians 9, 7, and allow that verse to work in your heart to help you become a cheerful giver. And then the third thing I recommend would be meditating on how much God has given us. John 3, 16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. Because when we think about all that God's given us, how can we not want to give to him cheerfully or worship him through giving in return? Now, when I was going over the sermon with Katie, I don't know if any of you have thought the same thing here. She said to me, didn't you say something like this toward the end of the last sermon? And I said, well, yeah, I did. <laughs> I was kind of hoping that was going to sneak by her, but it didn't. So she says, didn't you basically kind of end the last sermon saying something like this? And I said, I did. It was a little different, but the point was still the same. But here's the thing. I don't have a better reason to tell you to give. There is not something higher or greater that I can appeal to. I'm not going to tell you that it improves on your salvation. I'm definitely not going to tell you that giving is a way to be saved. I'm not going to tell you that 
giving is going to make you a more righteous or justified person because justification occurs by faith by grace through faith not a result of any effort or works on our part and so because i don't have a better or higher or greater reason to appeal to you to give cheerfully than thinking about what the lord has done for you i'm not going to appeal to anything else and if i have another sermon on giving i'll probably remind you again that the greatest reason we have to give or the reason we should give cheerfully or sacrificially is because of how cheerfully and sacrificially the lord gave to us it even says that jesus went to the cross because of the what that was set before him the joy that was sent jesus sacrificed very sacrificially and i would say even joyfully for us i don't have something better to give you than that i, I can't appeal to anything else the highest best and greatest reason to give is that it's a form of worship to the god who has given us so much including his own son if you have any questions or i can pray for you in any way i'd be up front after service and i'd consider it a privilege to speak with you father we do thank you for the act of worship that giving is and i pray if there's even one point more than anything else that comes out in these sermons it's that that we give not because we're commanded to that hopefully we wouldn't give because we feel obligated or bound to but that we would give cheerfully uh, joyfully sacrificially with very thankful hearts because it's a small way to worship you in response to all that you have done for us lord so i do thank you for that gift of giving i do thank you that we can come alongside the work happening in your kingdom whether giving to missionaries or to the church and just feel like you would use our small proceeds in some way lord i do thank you for that and we just ask again that you help all of us to see giving as an act of worship and we pray all this in jesus name amen